I've come to speak about preparing for eternity with God. And I want to begin by noting that the world is moving toward a certain destiny. The Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians 15 and verse 24 calls it the end. We do not know when the end will be. Jesus said, of that day and hour and those no man. 36. But we are moving toward destiny. And according to scripture, there will come a time when God will pull down the curtain on time. He will put a period to history. And it will be the end. And the end is going to be ushered in by four simultaneous events. The first will be the second coming of Christ. In John 14, 1 through 3, before he went back to the Father, he said, I go and I will come again. During the years of World War II, when General Douglas MacArthur was forced to leave the Philippines, he said to the Filipino people, I shall return. And he kept that promise. Christ said, I will come again, and he will keep that promise. The second event that will usher in the end is the resurrection of the dead and the change of the living. In 1 Corinthians 15, beginning at verse 51, Paul says, Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep. And he's talking about the sleep of death. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet. For the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and the living shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption. This mortal must put on immortality. So when this corruptible shall have put on incorruption and this mortal shall have put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. And a moment later he said, thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. There will be a resurrection of the dead. There will be a change of the living. When Christ comes, there will be people living on the earth. He may come while we're still living. But whether we're living or dead, it will not matter in the least. The living will be changed and the dead shall be raised. The third event is the destruction of the universe as we know it. In 2 Peter 3 and verse 10, Peter said, the day of the Lord comes as a thief in the night, in the which the heavens shall be dissolved, shall be burned up, shall pass away. The universe is going to be destroyed. And then the fourth event will be the judgment. According to Acts 17, 30 and 31, God has appointed a day in the which he will judge the world in righteousness by that man whom he hath ordained, whereof he's given us assurance in that he's raised him from the dead. As surely as Christ was raised, there will be a judgment. And beyond the judgment, there are two destinies. In Matthew 25, 31 and following, Jesus is the judge. Before him are all nations. To those on his right hand he says, Come, ye blessed of my Father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. To those on his left hand, he says, Depart from me, I never knew you. One of two destinies awaits 
all of us. And we are interested in spending eternity with God. So we are interested in going to heaven. And if I ask you tonight, how many of you want to spend eternity with God? And I, I, if I should ask you to raise your hands, every hand would go up. As a matter of fact, if you were standing on a busy street corner and you ask every person who passed, do you want to go to heaven? I can guarantee that most everyone would say most assuredly. But everybody talking about heaven isn't going there. Everybody is not going to spend eternity with God. Jesus said, not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven. He said there was, were, would be some at judgment who would hear him say, depart from me, you who work iniquity. The word iniquity means to be a law unto oneself. Everybody wants to go to heaven, but we would prefer to go to heaven on our own terms. And that won't work. We will go to heaven by the grace of God. We will go to heaven on His terms. Four simultaneous events will usher in the end of time and the end of the world. And beyond that, we want to live with God. But if we live with God, the preparation must be made now. Tonight, I want to suggest to you that as we prepare to spend eternity with God, there are at least three essentials. And I want to go to a rather obscure text to demonstrate those three truths. The passage is Hebrews chapter 13. And I'd like to ask you, if you would, to join me in Hebrews chapter 13. And as you're turning to that passage, let me remind you that the book of Hebrews was written to Jews who were living in the land of Palestine. They were called Hebrews. In the first century, Jews were scattered throughout the Roman world. Those who lived outside of Palestine sometimes spoke the Greek language and they brought into their lives the Greek culture. But those who remained in the land of Israel spoke Hebrew or Aramaic, a form of Hebrew, and they held to the old traditions. The Christians in Palestine were Jewish people who had obeyed the gospel. But they lived where the temple still stood, with all the elaborate ceremony. Many of their relatives did not become Christians. And so there was opposition. As a matter of fact, many of them were persecuted because of their faith in Christ. It was difficult for them to be Christians. And many of them were about to leave Christ and go back to Moses and the law. They were going to give up the gospel. And they were going back to the old way. The book of Hebrews was written to prevent that apostasy. And the author's method was to compare and contrast the law of Moses with the gospel of Christ. And he showed over and over again that the gospel was so much better than the law that one would be exceedingly foolish to leave Christ and to go back to Moses. At least a dozen times in the book of Hebrews, the author uses the word better to say that Christ and the gospel are better and they need to hold on to Christ at any cost and they need to embrace the gospel. Now with that background, let's come to Hebrews chapter 13 and I want to begin the reading at verse 9. The writer says, Do not be carried about with various and strange doctrines. I believe that he's referring there to returning to the law. The law has passed away. Do not return to the teachings of the law. He continued by saying, For it is good that the heart be established by grace. There he's talking about the gospel. 
Don't go back to the law. Hold on to the gospel of grace. Not with foods which have not profited those who have been occupied with them. He's referring to the food laws that existed under the law of Moses. Then he said at verse 10, we have an altar. Now the altar that he's talking about is the cross of Jesus Christ. He said, we have an altar from which those who serve the tabernacle have no right to eat. That is, as long as they held to the law, they could not embrace the gospel. And so they had no right to the blessings of the gospel. Then he said, for the bodies of those animals, referring to the animal sacrifices under the law, the bodies of those animals whose blood is brought into the sanctuary by the high priest for sin, referring to the Day of Atonement, when the high priest sprinkled the blood of an animal before the Ark of the Covenant and before God, and God forgot their sins for a year. But the next year, on the Day of Atonement, the sins of that year and all the years before were remembered because it was not possible that the blood of animals should take away sin. And having said that, he made this point. The bodies of those animals are burned outside the camp. That's important to what follows here. The bodies were not burned in the camp of Israel. They were burned outside the camp. Now the writer of Hebrews uses that to launch into his next statement. Therefore, you see when therefore appears in Scripture, we always have to stop and see what the therefore is there for. And it's referring to what he has just made, uh, said, what the point he has just made. Therefore, Jesus also, that he might sanctify, that is, set aside his people, people who are committed, consecrated, dedicated to God, Jesus, that he might sanctify the people with his own blood, the blood of the cross, suffered, now watch, suffered outside the gate. It is significant that Christ did not suffer in Jerusalem. Jerusalem represented Judaism. Jerusalem represented the old law. And the gospel of Christ is not an extension of the law, it is not a part of the law. The gospel of Christ stands by itself. And Christ did not die within Judaism, but rather he died outside of Jerusalem, outside the gate, on a hill between two thieves. The significance of that is this, that if any Jewish person was to receive the forgiveness of sin, he could not stay where he was. He could not stay in Jerusalem. He could not stay within Judaism. He had to leave Judaism and come to the cross. And so it is with us today. If we are to be saved, we must leave where we are. And where are we? Before the cross. Before the cross, before our coming to Jesus Christ, we were in sin, and we must leave that life, that practice of sin. We were in self-rule. We were in self-centeredness. We were in doing it my way and doing my thing. And all of that must be left behind. We must leave where we are, and we must come to where Jesus is, to the cross which is outside the gate. I want to suggest, first of all, that as we prepare for an eternity with God, we must come to the cross, Amen. the cross of Jesus Christ. In 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 17, the Bible says, If anyone be in Christ, he is a new creature or a new creation. That's what all of us need in our lives, and that's what's accomplished at the cross. We are made new creations. In Ephesians 2 and verse 10, 
Paul said that we are the workmanship of God. And that's a, a wonderful word that is translated workmanship. Because it literally means God's masterpiece. We are, in Christ, we are God's masterpiece. Created in Christ Jesus. Do you see? We are new creatures in Christ. In Ephesians 4, 22 through 24, Paul said, We put off the old man, the old self, which was corrupt according to his deceitful lusts, and we have changed the way that we think. We have been renewed in the spirit of our minds, and we have put on the new man, which in the likeness of God, in the likeness of God, has been created for righteousness and true holiness. That's what happens when people come to the cross. We in Christ are made new creations. In Ephesians chapter 2, 15 and 16, Paul was talking about Jews and Gentiles. And he said that in Christ, God has made Jew and Gentile. It doesn't matter what a person's background is. Anybody can be a child of God. But both Jews and Gentiles have been forged into what Paul called the one new man, the body of Christ. The one new man in this world today is the body of Christ, when in Ephesians, which in Ephesians is nothing other than the church. You see, when we become new creations in Christ, we are a part of the group of people that God is called by the gospel out of this world, separated unto himself, we have become the church of the living God. Now notice that Paul emphasizes that all of that happens, the new creation and the other blessings that come with it, all of that happens in Christ. And the Bible says that when we're baptized, we are baptized into Christ, Galatians 3.27. When we are baptized, we are portraying what Christ accomplished in his death and resurrection. At the heart of the gospel, there is the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. Paul said those things are of first importance in 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4. And in Romans 6, 17 and 18, Paul said, God be thanked. Whereas you were the slaves of sin, you have, now watch it, you have obeyed from the heart the form of teaching delivered. What was the teaching that was delivered? Christ died for our sins, he was buried, and he rose again the third day. In Romans chapter 6, Paul says, you obeyed the form of that teaching. In entering into Christ, we are poured into the form of his death, burial, and resurrection. I don't know anything about carpentry. I know nothing about working with concrete except this. When people work with concrete, they don't just throw it out on the ground. They make a form. And the concrete is poured into that form. And what happens? It conforms to the form. Now the form in the gospel is Christ's death, burial, and resurrection. We are poured into that form in that, as Paul put it earlier in Romans chapter 6, we die to sin. Christ died for sin, we die to sin. And then Paul went on in Romans 6 to say, Know ye not that so many of us, as were baptized into Christ, were baptized into his death where his blood was shed, so that we could reap the benefits of his blood. The power is not in the water of baptism, it's in the power of the blood of Christ. We were baptized into his death. And he went on to say, therefore we are buried with him by baptism into death. The teaching was Christ died, we die to sin. The teaching was Christ was buried. We're buried when we're baptized. And then Paul said in Romans 6, we rise to walk in newness of life. There is a resurrection from that watery grave. The teaching was Christ was raised and we are raised. 
And in Romans 6, Paul said, when we obeyed the form of the teaching, we then were made the servants or the slaves of righteousness. You see, we enter into Christ when we duplicate in our lives what Christ did for us. That makes us new creations in Jesus. But in 2 Corinthians 5, after Paul said, if anyone be in Christ, he's a new creation, and the old things are passed away, and all things are become new, he then went on to say, and all things are of God, who has reconciled us unto himself in Jesus Christ. You see, when we come to the cross, we are new creations. And being new creations, we're reconciled to God. Our sin took us away from God. Isaiah 59, 1 and 2 says, Your sins have separated between you and your God. What we need is to no longer be the enemies of God, alienated from God, but we need to be reconciled. And in Christ, that reconciliation takes place. Next, Paul said in 2 Corinthians 5 and verses 18 and 19, that God has given unto us these new creatures, these ones reconciled to God, that God has given unto us the ministry or the word of reconciliation. You see, when we're in Christ and new creatures, we're under the obligation of God to carry further the work of Christ, and our work is His work. He came to seek and to save the lost, and we have within our hands the gospel, which is the ministry of of reconciliation. And then Paul used the word ambassador. He said we are ambassadors for Christ. As though God did beseech you by us. We beg you in behalf of Christ to be reconciled to God. That's our work. An ambassador represents a nation. An ambassador usually is in foreign country. And as we learned so effectively last night, you and I are in a foreign country when we're in this world because our citizenship is in heaven. But we're representing God through Christ in this world as ministers of reconciliation. And then in the last verse of 2 Corinthians 5, Paul says that Christ was made to be sin for us. He wasn't made a sinner, but he was made to be sin for us. He took the place of sinners. And Paul says that was done in order that we might be made the righteousness of God in Him. God declares you to be righteous when you are a new creature in Christ, when you are reconciled to God, and when you are an ambassador for Christ. And there's one other thing that I want to emphasize in that section of 2 Corinthians. As Paul begins what we have in chapter 2, and remember that he didn't divide it into chapters, the thought doesn't end with the last verse, 21. But it continues to say, do not receive the grace of God in vain. The only reason we have the opportunity to be new creations in Christ is because of the grace of God. We can never be saved without the unmerited favor of God because we can't do enough. We can't be good enough to merit or earn our salvation. And then Paul made this point. Now is the accepted time. Now is the day of salvation. We must come to the cross. And coming to the cross, we are made new creations in Christ. And as new creations, we're reconciled to God. As the reconciled people of God, we're the ambassadors for Christ. We are declared to be righteous. And the time for that to occur is always in the immediate presence. No one in the book of Acts, the great book of conversions, who became a Christian, ever ate, drank, or slept after they heard the gospel until they obeyed it. There's an urgency about it. And as we prepare to spend eternity with God, first of all, we must come to where Christ is. We must leave where we are 
and come to the cross of Christ. Now let's come back to the text in Hebrews chapter 13. There is a second necessity in preparing to spend eternity with God. At verse 15, he said, Therefore by Him, by Christ, let us continually offer the sacrifice of praise to God, that is, the fruit of our lips, giving thanks in His name. I want to suggest that as we prepare for eternity with God, that we will be worshipers in the church. We will be worshipers in the church of Almighty God. In 1 Corinthians 14, Paul uses the expression in church, in the church, and in the churches. What does he mean by that? He's not talking, obviously, about a physical building. But he is talking about the people of God coming together in assembly. Did you know that 1 Corinthians 14 is a part of a context of worship? Beginning in chapter 10 of that book, where Paul deals with the Lord's Supper, through chapter 14, where he talks about preaching, prayer, and singing, and going on to chapter 16, where he talks about the contribution, and incidentally, those are the five avenues that the New Testament church used in worship. All of that is a context of worship, and Paul talks about being in church. And he identifies exactly what he means in verse 23. He said, when the whole church comes together, and I want to add, when the whole church comes together for the purpose of worship, we intend to worship. When we come together to worship, as the church, we need to understand that that assembly is regulated by God. Amen. You never worship God by accident. If you worship God, it must be when you intend to worship. That's why in our assemblies, we have announcements. I don't know anybody that says announcements are worship, but we're not intending for that to be worship. I wouldn't even say, and I'm sure you would agree, that being baptized is an act of worship. But we baptize people in the assembly. But when we intend to worship, we are limited to what God says. And we're limited because He regulates worship. Jesus put it this way in John 4 and verse 24. God is spirit. They that worship Him must worship Him in spirit and in truth. Now, I might have missed a lot in that passage, but I believe I saw this. When we worship God, we worship Him from the heart. We're not just going through the motions. It isn't something we do by rote, but it's something into which we and our spirit, the human spirit, enters. We worship God in spirit. We're there and we're involved. That's a far cry from making worship a time for us to be entertained, isn't it? We are the participants. We're not the observers. We worship God in spirit. And Jesus said, in truth. Since Jesus also said, God's word is truth, that tells me that I worship in the way that God wants me to worship. Do you know in the history of God's dealing with man, that he never did just tell people to worship? But he always told them and gave them instruction about how they were to worship. And we are to worship as the New Testament church worshiped. As we prepare to spend eternity with God, we will be involved in the worship of the church. And when the church assembles, that's where we're going to be. Because we are people who belong to God. And we long for and delight in the times that we come together as a church and our intention is to worship. I don't have very much patience with the guy who says, you know, I can worship God just as well out in the woods or down by the seashore as in anybody's building. Well, I can understand that when we're out in nature, we may think about God, but that's not the reason primarily we go to the woods or to the seashore. There is something about the assembling of the church that was so important that Hebrews 10.25 says, do not forsake it. Now let's look 
for a moment at the third thing that's mentioned in Hebrews chapter 13 as we prepare for an eternity with God. In verse 16 he said, Do not forget to do good and to share, for with such sacrifices God is well pleased. When Jesus was here, he went about doing good. He went about serving the needs of others. He was the great servant who left heaven in its glory where he was the subject of angelic worship. He came into a world where he would be despised, rejected of men and finally crucified. And Paul in Philippians chapter 2 is specific to say he became a slave. If you want to be like Jesus, be a great servant. We are preparing to spend eternity with God. One of these days the heavens are going to be rolled back as a scroll. And Jesus will appear. And when Jesus comes, we want to be prepared. And as we prepare, let us come to the cross. Leave where we are. And come to Him with all the significant implications of being at the cross. We will be people of worship. And we will be a part of a local church. And we will be present when the church meets. And we will be people who are great servants. And as we are caught up to be forever with Him, we will hear Him say, Well done, good and faithful servant. The question with which we close is this. Are you prepared right now to spend eternity with God? If you must say in your heart of hearts, no, sir. And if Jesus should appear right now, I wouldn't spend eternity with God. You could do something about that tonight. And I believe you know the way to prepare to spend eternity with God. Would anybody say yes to Jesus Christ tonight? then come as we stand and as we sing.